Boy, Tales of Childhood by Roald Dahl. Mr. Kumbis. The flush of triumph over the dead mouse was carried forward to the next morning as we all met again to walk to school. Let's go in and see if it's still in the jar, somebody said as we approached the sweet shop. Don't, Ewat said firmly. It's too dangerous. Walk past as though nothing has happened. As we came level with the shop, we saw a cardboard notice hanging on the door. Closed. We stopped and stared. We had never known the sweet shop to be closed at this time in the morning, even on Sundays. What's happened? We asked each other. What's going on? We pressed our faces against the window and looked inside. Mrs. Pratchett was nowhere to be seen. Look, I cried. The grub stopper's jar is gone. It's not on the shelf. There's a gap where it used to be. It's on the floor, someone said. It's smashed to bits and there's a gob stoppers everywhere. <gasps> there's the mouse, someone else shouted. We could see it all, the huge glass jar smashed to smithereens with a dead mouse lying in the wreckage and hundreds of many colored gob stoppers littering the floor. She got such a shock when she grabbed hold of the mouse that she dropped everything, somebody was saying. But why didn't she sweep it all up and open the shop, I asked. Nobody answered me. We turned away and walked toward the school. All of a sudden, we had begun to feel slightly uncomfortable. There was something not quite right about the shop being closed. Even Thiwats was unable to offer a reasonable explanation. We became silent. There was a faint scent of danger in the air now. Each one of us had caught a whiff of it. Alarm bells were beginning to ring faintly in our ears. After a while, Thiwats broke the silence. She must have got one of heck of a shock, he said. He paused. We all looked at him wondering what wisdom the great medical authority was going to come out with next. After all, he went on, to catch hold of a dead mouse when you're expecting to catch a hold of a gobstopper must be a pretty frightening experience. Don't you agree? Nobody answered him. Well now, Theots went on, when an old person like Mrs. Pratchett suddenly gets a very big shock, I suppose you know what happens next. What? He said, what happens? You ask my father, Theots said. He'll tell you. You tell us, we said. It gives her a heart attack, he was announced. Her heart stops beating, and she's dead in five seconds. For a moment or two, my own heart stopped beating. Thiwats pointed a finger at me and said darkly, I'm afraid you've killed her. Me? I cried. Why just me? It was your idea, he said. And what's more, you put the mouse in. All of a sudden, I was a murderer. Wanted for murder. At exactly that point, we heard the school bell ringing in the distance, and we had to gallop the rest of the way so we would not be late for prayers. Prayers were held in the assembly hall. We all perched in rows on wooded benches while the teacher sat up on the platform in armchairs facing us. The five of us, the five of us scrambled into our places, just as the headmaster marched in, followed by the rest of the staff. The headmaster is the only teacher at Landlaff Cathedral School that I can remember, and for a reason you will soon discover. I can remember him very clearly indeed. His name was Mr. Kumbis, and I have a picture in my mind of a giant man with a face like a ham and a mass of rusty colored hair that sprouted in a tangle all over the top of his head. All grown-ups appear as giants to small children, but headmasters and policemen are the biggest giants of all and acquire a marvelously exaggerated stature. It is possible that Mr. Kumbis was a perfectly normal being, but in my memory, he was a giant, a tweed-suited giant, who always wore a black gown over his tweeds and a waistcoat under his jacket. Mr. Kumbis now proceeded to mumble through the same old prayers we had every day, but this morning, when the last amen had been spoken, he did not turn and lead his group rapidly out of the hall as usual. He remained standing before us, and it was clear he had an announcement to make. The whole school is to go out and line up around the playground immediately, he said. Leave your books behind and no talking. Mr. Kumbas was looking grim. His hammy pink face had taken on that dangerous scowl, which only appeared when he was extremely cross and somebody was for the high jump. I sat there small and frightened among the rows and rows of other boys. And to me at that moment, the headmaster, with his black gown draped over his shoulders, was like a judge at a murder trial. After the killing, the Watts whispered to me. I began to shiver. I'll bet the police were already here, the Watts went on, and the Black Maria's waiting outside. As we made our way back out to the playground, my whole stomach began to feel as though it was slowly filling up with swirling water. 
I'm only eight years old. I told myself, no little boy of eight has ever murdered anyone. It's not possible. Out in the playground on this warm, cloudy September morning, the deputy headmaster was shouting, Line up in forms! Sixth form over there! Fifth form next to them! Spread out! Spread out! Get on with it! Stop talking, all of you! Diwath and I and my other three friends were in the second form, the lowest but one, and we lined up against the red brick wall of the playground, shoulder to shoulder. I can remember that when every boy in the school was in his place, the line stretched right around the four sides of the playground, about 100 small boys all together, ages between 6 and 12, all of us wearing identical gray shorts and gray blazers and gray stockings and black shoes. Stop that talking, shouted Deputy Head. I want absolute silence. But why, for heaven's sake, were we in the playground at all, I wondered. And why were we lined up like this? It had never happened before. I half expected to see two policemen come bounding out of the school to grab me by the arms and put handcuffs on my wrists. A single door led out from the school onto the playground. Suddenly it swung open and through it, like the death of an angel, sto strode Mr. Kumbas, huge and bulky in his tweed suit and black gown, and beside him, believe it or not, right beside him trotted the tiny figure of Mrs. Pratchett herself. <gasps> Mrs. Pratchett was alive! Oh, the relief was tremendous. She's alive, I whispered to Thiwat standing next to me. I didn't kill her. Thiwat's ignore me. We'll start over here, Mr. Kubas was saying to Mrs. Pratchett. He grasped her by one of her skinny arms and then led her over to where the sixth form was standing. Then, still keeping hold of her arm, he proceeded to lead her to, at a brisk walk, to all the light of boys. It was like someone expecting the troops. What on earth are they doing? I whispered. Thiwats didn't answer me. I glanced at him. He had some rather pale. Too big, I heard Mrs. Pratchett saying. Much too big. It's none of this lot. Let's have a look at some of them titchy ones. Mr. Kumbas increased his pace. We'd better all go all the way round, he said. He seemed in a hurry to get it over with now, and I could see Mrs. Pratchett's skinny goat's legs trotting to keep up with him. They had already inspected one side of the playground where the sixth form and the half of the fifth form were standing. We watched them moving down the second side, then the third side. Still too big, I heard Mrs. Pratchett's croaking. Much too big. Smaller than these. Much smaller. Where's them nasty little ones? They were coming closer to us now. Closer and closer. They were standing on the fourth side. Every boy in our form was watching Mr. Kumis and Mrs. Pratchett's as they came walking down the line towards us. Nasty, cheeky, lot these little ones. I heard Mrs. Pratchett muttering. They comes into my shop and they think they can do all they damn well likes. Mr. Kumas made no reply to this. They nick things when I ain't looking, she went on. They put their grubby hands all over everything and they got no manners. I don't mind girls. I never have no trouble with girls, but boys is ideas and horrible. I don't have to tell you that, Edmaster, do I? These are the smaller ones, Mr. Kumas said. I could see Mrs. Pratchett's pinky little eyes staring hard at the face of each boy she passed. Suddenly she let out a high-pitched yell and pointed a dirty finger at, straight at the Watts. It's him! She yelled, that's one of them! I know him a mile away, the scummy little bounder! The entire school turned to look at the Watts. W -w -w what have I done? He shuddered, appealing to Mr. Kumas. Shut up! Mr. Kumas says. Mrs. Pratchett's eyes flickered over and settled on my own face. I looked down and studied the black asphalt surface of the playground. Here's another one of them. I heard her yelling, that one there. She was pointing at me now. You're quite sure, Mr. Kumba says. Oh, of course I'm sure, she cried. I never forgets a face. Least of all, I'm as sly as that. He's one of them, all right. There's five altogether. Now where's them other three? The other three, as I knew very well, were coming up next. Mrs. Pratchett's face was glimmering with venom as her eyes traveled beyond me down the line. There they are, she shout, cried out, stabbing the air with her finger. I'm an am and am. That's five of them right there. We don't need to look no farther than this, and Master. They're all here, the nasty, dirty little pigs. You've got their names, have you? I've got their names, Mrs. Pratchett, Mrs. Kumas told her. I'm much obliged to you, and I'm much obliged to you. And master, she answered. As Mr. Kumbas led her way across the playground, we heard her saying, Right in the jar of gobstoppers it was a stinking dead mouse, which I will never forget as long as I live. You have my deepest sympathy, Mr. Kumbas was muttering. Talk about shucks, 
she went on. When my fingers caught hold of that nasty, soggy, sticky bed mouse, her voice trailed away as Mr. Kumbas led her quickly through the door into the school building.